I'm going to talk to you this morning about marriage. And if you don't have a sense of humor, you don't really need to consider marriage <laughs> as an option for you. You probably need to stay single. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we have the Apostle Paul giving instructions about marriage. And of course, uh, he would be a good one to do it since he actually was not married. Right? But he did uh, seek to help the people for whom he was uh, ministering. And uh, in chapter 7 begins the section of 1 Corinthians where the Apostle Paul actually addresses some of the questions that the Corinthian church had written him about. It, it opens this way, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me. So, He's saying, okay, now we're going to get to the stuff you wrote about. He says, it's not good, or it is good, excuse me, for a man not to touch a woman. Now, some translations mistranslate this and say it's that the Apostle Paul is saying it's good for a man not to marry a woman. That is not what this means. Uh, the euphemism to touch uh, literally stood in the place of sexual relations. So in essence, uh, what this is saying is it's good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But now, is the Apostle Paul saying that? I don't believe he is. Uh, I believe that what he's doing is quoting what the Corinthians have been telling him. There has always been this uh, idea in the church, uh, and it's been for centuries now, this, this dualism between the spiritual nature of man and the physical nature, and that somehow when you become a Christian, your spiritual nature is good and your physical nature is bad. And uh, in fact, a lot of Christians, in order to be, quote, more spiritual, have tried to get away from the physical, tried to stop eating as much as possible, stop drinking, get away from people. Uh, you know, not having sex or, or doing any, getting involved in worldly things because that's not spiritual. Uh, so the question could be addressed this way. Can married people be spiritual? <laughs> Some people who've been married for years and that hasn't necessarily been a good situation might say, I'm, I'm not sure people can be married and be spiritual. But um, I don't believe that's true. Uh, the spiritual is not incompatible with the physical. In fact, one of the ways that Jesus shows us that the, the physical is okay is that someday, rather than us just being for e all eternity spiritual beings, we're going to be spiritual beings in an eternally physical body. A body that's resurrected, a better body than we have now, but it'll still be a body. And so uh, I believe that uh, what the Apostle Paul is doing is addressing this idea that now that we're Christians, we, we can't really have the same relationship as husband and wife that we once had because that's dirty, because that's not spiritual. And uh, the Apostle Paul says in verse 2, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. In other words, let the husband render his duty to his wife, and let every woman do the same for her husband. The wife does not have power over her own body, but the husband, and likewise, also, the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. And in a society where the men had a great deal of power in the relationship, it's, it's an amazing statement here that the Apostle Paul says, look, the women don't have power over their bodies. They're not in control of them. They can't live like they're single. They can't live like they're on their own, but neither can the men. There are responsibilities and duties Husbands and wives belong to each other. That's a part of what it means to be married and to have a one flesh relationship. 
You don't belong to yourself anymore. You, I don't do the same things I used to do when I was single. I don't live the same way I used to live when I was single. If I did, I'd be single again. Uh, my wife expects better of me, more of me, and uh, I of her as well. We can't live like we're two separate individuals. Although it seems now for three weeks that's the way we're trying to live, it, uh, it doesn't last long. She'll be back soon, and I'll be back to my old form real soon. When you're married, you have to fulfill your marital responsibilities. And, there, and it's not just about sex. That's one responsibility that you have because it is the intimacy that draws you together as one flesh. But there's a lot more to it than just that. And uh, people who think that you get married to solve your problems don't realize. You solve some problems, but you end up creating other problems. Okay? Uh, relationships are tough. Relationships are challenging. Relationships are often difficult. And we'll talk a little more about that in a, in a minute. But... He does mention the fact that spiritual activities uh, should not be allowed to interfere with the intimacy in the relationship. That they should, if they have to withdraw for spiritual involvement such as fasting and prayer, verse uh, 5, they should do that only temporarily and they should come back together again because uh, Paul is concerned that they not allow the enemy, and there is an enemy. Uh, I was interested this week to hear that uh, Justice Scalia uh, says he believes in a devil, <coughs> in, a, in Satan. You know that? A Supreme Court justice believing in the devil? I think that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Because we do have a an enemy, and that enemy seeks any opportunity to get into a relationship and mess with it. Don't let him. So can married people be spiritual? Yes. But what about remaining single? Now, I'm going to say some things today that uh, don't sound like some of the things you've heard before. Or maybe sound opposite of what you've heard before. Uh, so you better listen carefully because I believe uh, you may need to hear it. Uh, first of all, he says in verse 7, For I would, he says, I speak this, verse 6, by uh, permission and not commandment. He's not commanding them to uh, be married, he say, for I would that all men were even as I myself. But every man has his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. I would say, therefore, to the widows or to the unmarried and widows, widowers and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. Now, how was the Apostle Paul? Single. So he's recommending that uh, they abide or remain even as he, single. But if they cannot contain themselves, let them marry, for it's better to marry than to burn. To burn with passion, to burn with lust. Okay, so uh, the first question is, in this what about remaining single, is this one. And I've heard it put this way, that singleness is a gift, and if you have that gift, you should remain single. And if you don't have that gift, then by all means marry. <coughs> uh, I don't believe that. There's, there are a couple of reasons I don't believe that. Listen carefully. Number one, this passage where he says, each man has his proper gift of God, one after this manner and an, another after that, doesn't. it's not clear that he's talking about Singleness as a spiritual gift. It could actually be translated this way. Each one has his gift of ministry. One in, as a married person and another as a single person. In fact, in another place, the Apostle Paul says, don't we have the right to have wives along with us as the other apostles do? Certainly he did. Now, here's the, here's the real reason that I don't believe he's saying that you, if you have the gift of singleness, you stay single. And that is this. Everywhere else in this passage he talks about singleness, he talks about it as a choice. 
For instance, if they cannot contain themselves, let them marry. Uh, verse 26. Uh, I suppose, therefore, that this is uh, good for the present distress. It's good for a man not, uh, uh, so to be. Uh, are you bound unto a wife? Don't seek to be loosed from her. If you're loosed from a wife, don't seek to be bound. That sounds like a choice. But if you do marry, you have not sinned, he says. So in other words, it's a choice. If you marry, it's not wrong. If you stay unmarried, that's not wrong. But it's a choice. You have to make the choice about how you're going to live your life. And I could go on further. In fact, later on he talks to the father of an unmarried woman. Why would he talk to the father? Because you see, back in those days, they didn't date. They didn't have control over finding their own mate. Uh, get this, their parents picked their mate. <clears throat> How would you like your father and mother to get together and pick yours? <laughs> well, that's the way it was, okay? That's the way it was. But he says to this person, uh, but if any man think that he behaves himself uncomely toward his virgin, in other words, toward his daughter who's a virgin, if she has passed the flower of her age, that means probably she's getting close to 20. Back then they married sometimes pretty early, so I don't, I don't know, 20, 30, who, who knows? Past the flower of their age, he says, and, they, and the need so require, let him do what he will, he sins not, let them marry. In other words, it's a choice, again, it's a choice. Nevertheless, he that stands steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but has power over his own will, and is so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin, he does well. In other words, it takes determination to remain single. It takes determination. But it's certainly a choice. And the Apostle Paul recommends this choice. In fact, Jesus says that singleness is a choice. In Matthew 19, verse 12, he says that some men are eunuchs from birth, some are eunuchs by the choice of others, but some have chosen to be eunuchs, I would say they're single, for the kingdom of God, for the sake of the kingdom. And Paul was one of those for the sake of the kingdom. He remained single so that his ministry might not be unimpeded or unhindered by the responsibilities that a wife and family would bring. Singleness is recommended by the Apostle Paul here in this passage for several reasons. Now remember, he's not addressing every situation in life. He's addressing a particular circumstance. He's addressing Corinthian believers. And he says that they are, because of the present distress, it would be good for them to remain single. Now we don't have a clue as to what the present distress was. But I'm going to tell you that if you think that marriage is a way to deal with your financial difficulties, don't get married. <clears throat> it doesn't. It doesn't solve your financial problems. And if that's the reason you're getting married, if it solves your financial problems, it's not going to help you in other ways. Uh, maybe you're distressed by loneliness. Marriage isn't the solution to that. I have known married people who feel lonely, haven't you? Marriage doesn't solve your personal problems. You think that marriage is going to fix you, you're sadly mistaken about marriage. It wasn't designed to fix you. <laughs> That's not what it's all about. So whatever distress they were in at that particular time, Paul says it might be better to remain single. He also says in verse 28 that the reason he's suggesting this, nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I want to spare you. How many of you know that there are troubles that come with marriage? Challenges and responsibilities that come with marriage. As I mentioned, relationships are not easy. It takes a lot of work. People who get married and think that it just comes naturally, to relate to this other person, 
<laughs> I don't know where they got it, but it isn't the way it works, is it? It doesn't work that way. You gotta, there's a lot of work to learn somebody else, especially since usually the person you marry is a lot different than you in many respects. You've got to learn a whole new way of thinking if you're going to understand how that person's thinking. He also says in verse 29, he's recommending it because the time is short. And he says, during this short time, <clears throat> people who are married should learn to live as though they're not, people who weep as though they don't, that they, as though they rejoice, and those that rejoice as, they, as though they weep, those that buy as though that are, they're not possessed. In other words, what's he, what's he saying here? Because the time is short, and by the way, <clears throat> I believe that the time is short. I don't believe that we're going to have a, a lot of time. Things are happening in our world drawing our world together in a way that, that, you know, before we couldn't understand how the book of Revelation, how those, those things that it talks about would even be possible. One world government. I mean, our world was so fragmented, but we're seeing that take place today, aren't we? We're seeing things like that happen. I mean, you can't, you can't even have an economic system where one country fails without it rippling through the whole world. Mm -hmm. It's not just that if our economy fails, it'll be devastating to the world. If it happens in Japan or China or somewhere else, it's going to be tough as well. We're seeing that time. And, it, and we're going to have to start learning to, to find a way to focus on our spiritual lives and our spiritual relationships. Time is short. We've got a, a few, maybe days, months, years to get our houses in order before it hits a fan. I'm, I'm serious. I believe that. So we better get to work on that. Uh, he says that he's recommending singleness so that they won't be distracted. He says, verse 32, but I would have you without carefulness or without being encumbered by this care, this concern. What concern? He goes on to mention, if you're married, you don't just have to think about yourself. You have to think about this other person too. How you may please your wife. How you may please your husband. There are responsibilities there and you can't just ignore it. You can't just walk off and say, I'm going to be spiritual. It doesn't work that way person who's unmarried, verse 34, cares, it says, for the things of the Lord, that she may be uh, both holy in body and spirit. But she that's married cares for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. He says, I'm not talking about this to try to ensnare you, to try to tempt you. He says, but I want you to be Devoted to the Lord, verse 35, that you may attend upon the Lord without distraction. There's a need for people to focus on the Lord. Whether married or unmarried, we're going to find, have to find ways to do that. I was reading about the life of A.W. Tozer. How many of you have heard of A.W. Tozer? A few of you. Boy, I'd like to introduce more of you to A.W. Tozer. He wrote some tremendous books. The knowledge of the holy, the pursuit of God. These are classic Christian works, and they're small. Anybody could read them. I was reading about his life, how he worshiped God every day on the floor of his study, on his face before God, seeking God. What an amazing testimony! And he was a man of God because of that. Now let me tell you something else that you need to remember or understand or learn. And that is, if you want to have a relationship with God, it's going to take some work. That doesn't happen easily or naturally either. You're going to have to get on your face before God. You're going to have to get into His Word. You're going to have to learn to pray. 
If you want a relationship with God, you're going to have to learn these things. And it's not going to come naturally. It's not going to come easily. But if you want it, you're going to have to learn to do it. So what about remaining single? That's an option. <clears throat> what about Christians in divorce? It goes back to verse 10. Uh, that's where I'm going, back to verse 10. And it says uh, that there, he's answering, uh, to, the, to the married, verse 10, I command, yet not I, but the Lord. He says, this is not just what I'm telling you. This is what the Lord said. And the Lord gave instructions. Jesus gave instructions about marriage, didn't he? He answered a question about marriage and divorce. And this is what the Lord said. Let the wife uh, not depart from her husband. In other words, don't let the wife divorce her husband. But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. In other words, God's will is for Christians to remain married. If divorce occurs, the believer is to be reconciled or to remain unmarried. This is, this is not my instruction. This is not my idea. This is what the Word of God says clearly. An exception is made by Jesus, not here, but by Jesus, uh, concerning marital unfaithfulness. That you are free to remarry if the person that divorced you was unfaithful. Another question that Jesus didn't answer because it wasn't an issue at the time is, what if my spouse doesn't share my faith? Verse 12, but to the rest I speak I, not the Lord. If any brother has a wife that believes not, and she's pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. A woman who has a husband that doesn't believe, and if he's pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. So what if my spouse doesn't share my faith? Number one, verse 39, a Christian should marry another Christian. Mm -hmm. He says, verse 39, uh, she's at liberty to be married to whom she will, only how? In the Lord. Only in the Lord. Marry a believer. But, what happens if both of you are unbelievers and one of you gets saved and the other person doesn't? How do you deal with that situation? If a believer is married to an unbeliever, the believer should stay. If the unbeliever leaves, the believer has no obligation to hold the relationship together. Remember the rule. It takes two to make a relationship. This is, this is marriage math. It takes two to make a relationship. It only takes one to break it. It's marriage math. Like it or not. It's the way it works. A believer can have a sanctifying influence in the relationship. Uh, he says, uh, verse 16, For do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how can you know whether uh, you will save your wife? In other words, there's a possibility that you, you can't save anybody, can you? He's not talking about a husband saving an unbelieving wife or a wife saving an unbelieving husband. He's talking about the fact that a, a believer can have a powerful impact on the relationship. Unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. You don't know whether you can have an impact or not. But there's a possibility. And where there's a possibility, there's hope. So what is the guiding principle? Well, I'm going to conclude with the middle section of this passage. Verse 17, But as God has distributed to every man, as the Lord has called everyone, so let him walk. Is there any man called being circumcised? Let him not be uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. In other words, wherever you find yourself in life, understand that your circumstances do not determine your joy, your happiness, or your satisfaction. A lot of people believe that if I just change my circumstances, if I just get a different job, if 
I just get a different husband or wife, or if I just go to a different city, or if I can just get out of this particular situation, that somehow my life will, that's in a mess right now, will all of a sudden fall together. Doesn't work. You know what I've found? I can change jobs, but I take me with me. I can change wives, but I take me with me. I'm still going to have the same problems, hang-ups, difficulties, challenges. I just change a different set of circumstances, and I have to deal with who I am in those new circumstances. Changing our circumstances doesn't guarantee improvement. <laughs> Getting married doesn't guarantee improvement. Getting divorced doesn't guarantee improvement. We don't belong to ourselves. Verse 23, you are bought with a price. Have we heard that before in 1 Corinthians? Well, maybe you haven't. You might have missed that particular sermon. But he said it twice already. You're bought with a price. What price have you been bought with? The blood of Jesus Christ. You don't belong just to your wife or to your husband. You belong to the Lord. Brethren, he says, verse 24, Let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. In another place, the Apostle Paul puts it this way, I have found that whatever state or condition I'm in, therewith to be what? To be content. To be content. Learn contentment in life. Learn to trust the Lord to help you deal with your circumstances. Learn to trust the Lord to help you face your challenges. Learn to trust the Lord. And finally, and most importantly, listen. We need to make sure that our relationship with God is the most important thing. How we may serve the Lord is the question that we need to be asking. Our relationship with God is more important even than our relationship with our husband or wife. Make sure that relationship stays firm.